Okay, so we are live. Um, I would like to first thank um, Professor Floyd for joining us for the second day of the 14th uh, meeting of studies on the origins of uh, contemporary philosophy. We also have here with us um, Professor Ubel and Professor Van der Schaam. I would like to also thank um, Professor Mauro for coming and um, commenting on um, Professor Floyd's talk. And uh, also thank our audience here in the auditorium and our online audience on um, YouTube. So, um, Professor Floyd, without further ado, please, um, you may begin your talk. Thank you very much, Arthur. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very happy to see Mauro and very grateful for his comments, which he sent me ahead of time and which I do not have answers for all the questions. And it's lovely to see Maria and Thomas again. This talk is actually, part of it is already published in a paper. And so I just want to make clear, I sent Mauro that paper as well. So he's commented on that. And I don't think, I think normally you don't give slides on a talk you've already published, but in this case, there are many loose ends to what I'm doing. It's a kind of thread. And so I hope people will be patient about this. Um, I'm going to go quickly. And what I'm going to try to do is to bring together three people who are ordinarily regarded as rather different from one another, which of course, I'm not suggesting that they aren't very different from one another. Um, but I want to draw, draw a kind of thread through the tradition, thinking about formalism and thinking about Wittgenstein's relationship to that in light of contemporary problems. So I took the title of your conference very seriously, and that's what I'll be trying to do. My metaphor is going to be the surveyability of proof. And I think that this notion really requires clarification, particularly in light of Wittgenstein's philosophy of mathematics, which I've been working on for a long time. And there is a lot of dispute about how to translate this concept, what role it plays in his philosophy of math. I should say I was down at Penn uh, last March and I saw the Elizabeth Enscombe archives. What I wanted to see were her draft translations of remarks on the foundations of mathematics Wittgenstein's, the compilation they made of Wittgenstein's work, she struggled mightily. I'm somewhat critical of her translating sometimes, but in terms of the amount of care and work she put in to that translation, it's incredibly admirable. And at one point, and I don't know whether this was because of discussions with Geech or someone else, she considered translating Übersichtlichkeit or Übersehbarkeit as inspectability, which I... Oh, I don't know why it does that. <laughs> okay, um, there you go. I won't make quote marks. So inspectability is not really an English word, but I just throw that out there to tell you there's a lot of controversy. No, but the point is that it's already in Hilbert 1920 that we read of the Überblickbarkeit, the Überseebarkeit, and the Übersichtlich kind of proof. So I want to insist that Wittgenstein has at least partly, not totally, partly inherited that notion from Hilbert and I'm going to argue that he's taking that notion up and beginning to think with it, particularly in 1939, during his discussions with Turing in his Cambridge lectures. Now, we all know, I guess, that Wittgenstein's Blue Book in 1933-4 asks for a survey, I'll translate it surveyability for now, of the concept of humans operating mechanically with signs. And I've argued elsewhere that Turing was impacted by the Blue Book. I find this not a very big hypothesis. It is controversial. I don't have a proof text for that, but I do have proof texts that later, after he attended the Cambridge lectures, Turing was uh, impacted on by Wittgenstein because he says so. Turing's most famous paper of 1936 on computable numbers, which gives us his analysis of a human being reckoning according to a formal rule, that takes as fundamental the idea of symbols being able to be taken in by a glance, at a glance by humans. So although he doesn't use the word Übersehbarkeit or Übersichtlichkeit, I'm going to take Turing to have been trucking in something like or orbiting in the area of the notion I want to try to isolate. Wittgenstein, obviously, in his manuscripts 1937 to 44, when philosophy of math is central for him and philosophy of logic, he's investigating explicitly what he calls the surveyability of proof in logic, and mathematics versus in philosophy. And Turing in 1939 to 44, after he attends Wittgenstein letters, 
lectures, began to emphasize, as he put it explicitly in reaction to Wittgenstein, the development of what he called mathematical phraseology, a word he probably got from Russell's introduction to math philosophy, for the sake of surveyability. I will say that that's what he was doing. He doesn't use the word, but anyway, my reconstruction has him using the notion. Now, one question is whether surveyability is some kind of requirement on proofs. <clears throat> and I think it's a dangerous idea to think that it is. Many proofs and sentences are very difficult to hold in mind or survey at a glance. I think we cannot mean a visual or purely psychological criterion, but nevertheless, in the root meaning of Ubisay Bakkeit, we have this visual metaphor going on. Another kind of question today is the question of whether computer proofs or models are ways of increasing surveyability. We have large data sets, we have modeling with them, beautiful pictures coming back from telescopes. Uh, but I think that <clears throat> the question of the automation of proofs, the answer has to be yes and no. <clears throat> it's pretty obvious that articulation and phraseology at the right level is crucial for our, any sort of level of understanding something as a proof. Ultimately, though, I think Hilbert Wittgenstein and Turing have in mind something every day, something that can be done and the aim of surveyability here is communication without disagreement. So that's what I'm going to take to be the heart. Among my leitmotifs are these, psychology doesn't govern the foundations of logic or mathematics. They're not beholden to any particular theory of mind. This is, of course, familiar from readers of Frege, but I would follow Georg Kreisel, no matter, never mind. Second, the limitative results of Gödel, Post, Church, and Turing do not turn on or entail any particular theory of mind, despite what Emil Post and Gödel thought Turing was doing. And I would side Turing with Hilbert and Wittgenstein for this reason. I think there's been far too much centralizing of philosophy of mind in reading Turing and not enough understanding how much philosophy of logic was very central to his work. And I think we can see this by revisiting his analysis of the notion of a formal system of logic and explaining how it's rooted in anti-psychologism about logic, inherited from, of course, Frege, but also Hilbert and Wittgenstein, as well as certain foundational ideals of simplicity, objectivity, and clarity of everyday human phraseology. <laughs> so to repeat, I think Turing's philosophical attitude has been distorted in controversies in the philosophy of mind. My beloved teacher, Hilary Putnam, rather invented functionalism when he was at MIT thinking about modeling inductive inference. Our last conversation concerned the Turing machine, and I told him, Hilary, no, he said, well, it was built for a logical alien, it has nothing to do with humans. I think that's dead wrong. So because of Putnam's work and others, Turing was read as a kind of behaviorist, a reductionist, or a functionalist. And then we have spinning off from the discussions of AI ideas like the singularity, in which machines will inevitably become the primary drivers of cultural change and creativity. This is not Turing's view, and I think it's important that it wasn't. Turing was very far seeing about AI, I think. So Turing was neither a behaviorist nor a reductive mental mechanist. The foundations of logic and math not philosophy of mind was central for his work. And in particular, the social matter of the intersubjective communicability was crucial in Turing's philosophy of mathematics. And this is the part that I think affiliates him with Hilbert and Wittgenstein. Turing always focused on taking what we say and do with words seriously and on the limits of formal methods, not only on their power. And for him, everyday language, including our typings of objects, as they occur naturally in science and everyday life, are an evolving framework or technology. Turing stressed human conversation and common sense is foundational. And in this sense, he was a Cambridge philosopher of his time. I bet he was reading Peirce. I can't prove it. There's also a certain pragmatist flavor. So let's look at Hilbert in 1920. Proof procedures become completely surveyable. Here he talks, it uses the phrase Uba Blickbar, and of course, he's discussing metamathematics, the formalized presentation of proofs in his proof theory. Then he goes on. The figures we take as objects must be completely surveyable. 
and only discrete determinations are to be considered for them. It's only under these conditions that our claims and considerations have the same reliability and evidence as an intuitive number theory. So he's going to take it as an equipollent level of certainty. Finally, a formalized proof like a numeral is a concrete and surveyable object. It can be communicated from beginning to end. And I highlight this. This phrase we will see in Wittgenstein's writings echoed many times. The point about a proof is that it comes to an end. Perhaps the interpretation of the proof doesn't, but the proof as a proof has to be accepted and shareable. So I just want to say a word about subitizing versus the beginnings of mathematics in Wittgenstein's sense. It's obviously too difficult for a human to take in at a glance, that is without arranging, counting, or labeling, the difference between those pairs of strokes. I'm sorry, I got tired. Probably I should have done more strokes, but in any case, it's pretty clear. Um, Hilbert doesn't use the stroke notation, by the way, but he uses ones and signs. So what I think psychologists call our number sense, subitizing, the ability to count at a glance, which is shared in the animal kingdom very widely. I gather spiders can discriminate, you know, two from three <laughs> at a glance. But that gives out very quickly in the stroke notation and when we get to larger numbers. It gives out later in the decimal notation. So one of the purposes of the decimal notation is to enable taking in at a glance after subitizing gives out. And famously, Kripke in his uh, 1992 Whitehead lectures, in a sort of Wittgensteinian version of logicism, argued that the first integers in the decimal notation serve as what he called buckstoppers. They can be taken in without dispute. So it's an allusion to Truman's idea that the buck stops here. What I would say about Hilbert, Wittgenstein, and Turing is that they are philosophically committed to the idea that there must be buck stoppers. That is, there is some representational necessity of logic and mathematics that requires this, but it needn't be the Arabic notation as in Kripke. And this is not merely a feature of the human mind or certain specific notations. It's a feature of what mathematics is. Here's Wittgenstein. A dispute may arise over the correct result of a calculation, say a rather long addition, but such disputes are rare and of short duration. They can be decided, as we say, with certainty. Mathematicians don't in general quarrel over the results of a calculation. This is an important fact. Were it otherwise, if, for instance, one mathematician was convinced that a figure had altered unperceived, or that his or someone else's memory had been deceptive and so on, then our concept of mathematical certainty would not exist. And in the very first lecture of 1939 with Turing in the audience, one of the first jokes Wittgenstein tells is teaching Turing the, what the letter sigma is. And he imagines telling Turing, write me a sigma on the board, and Turing cuts the picture out of the book that was used to teach him and pastes it up on the board. So that's a joke between them about this issue of the sameness of signs and the importance of this at the basis. Now, Turing addressed himself to the Entscheidungsproblem, which was formulated in 1928 in the Hilbert School, show that there exists a definite method that can determine for every statement of mathematics expressed formally in an axiomatic system, they have in mind first order logic, which has been carved out by now, whether or not that statement can be deduced from the axioms. So that's the question to which Turing addressed his 1936 paper. Now, the question is, what is a definite method? So to satisfactorily resolve the Entscheidung's problem, what you have to do, because the answer is a negative, it's not a positive. If there were a decision procedure, the task would be to write down the algorithm. But to prove that there isn't one, what you have to do is to analyze what is meant in general by a formal system and a step in a formal system in the relevant Hilbertian sense. I want to stress that this could not have been done by simply writing down another formal system or by discussing in the meta language various kinds of different formal systems. And this is why the so-called logic-free versions of lambda definability and the Herbron gödel klini equational systems were used. And this is why Turing devised his so-called machines, which are really humans, with command tables. But I want to stress that you couldn't just write down a formal system. You had to analyze what it is. 
Now, this is just going over basic logic history. Churchclin and Rosser in 35 showed that the class of functions calculable in the HGK calculus is coextensive with the class of lambda definable functions. Church then, building on Gödel's incompleteness paper, demonstrated that there's no effectively calculable function which decides whether two lambda definable expressions are equivalent. And so now we have the notion of effectively calculable isolated. Six was to show that none of his machines could compute the desired general procedure as an application of his wholly novel analysis of what it is to take a step in a formal system if you're a human. And in the appendix of his paper, the functions he shows that the functions Turing machines can compute are just those that are lambda definable. So this lent great weight to the analysis of computability. We have three different ways of analyzing. They're all coextensive. But I want to stress that Turing's is the analysis that really captured people's attention because of a philosophical set of resonances, because it's more surveyable. So Turing's particular way of resolving the Entscheidungs problem was not the application of a pre-existing blueprint of ideas and methods in the metamathematics literature. The people coming out of the Hilbert School would never have done what he did. They were mathematicians. They were working with the lambda calculus, equation systems. That's not what Turing ultimately was doing. What Turing did was to offer a philosophically informed analytic exercise, an intuitively satisfying survey of surveyability. Turing's deployment of his central argument, I think, bears the stamp of Wittgenstein's way of thinking about logic anthropologically rather than metamathematically. So for me, that's very important about the notion of a Turing machine. It's not just more metamathematics. Turing analyzed what a step in a formal system is by thinking through what it's for, what's done with it. And in fact, the comprehensiveness of his treatment its lack of morals, to use the Carnapian idea, lies here. Turing made the very idea of a formal system plain, or homespun, which is the term Wittgenstein uses in the spring of 37 after he's read the paper. And later, in 47, Wittgenstein writes, Turing's machines, these are humans who calculate. Here's Wittgenstein on surveyability 37 to 39. There's a great deal of activity with the notion during the period of the 39 lectures at Cambridge. So I believe there was a kind of resonance going on or some kind of indirect conversation going on mutually between Wittgenstein and Turing at this time about this material. So surveyability is part of proof, but again, this is not stated as a requirement, I think, but as something to be investigated. He puts in quotes in RFM 3 from 1939, a mathematical proof must be surveyable then he investigates that. Again, we construct the proof once and for all. That reminds us of Hilbert. And his ideas include the following. Principia proofs need to be made surveyable with the help of a variety of different mathematical techniques. So in a sense, Principia is a foundation, but we use mathematics in order to understand what a proof is in Principia. And therefore, communicability remains a central feature of proof. The calculational aspect requires that disagreements terminate in agreement that a conclusion follows. Now, I'm following Felix Mulholzer's analysis of surveyability in his commentary on the 1939 uh, manuscripts. And here what he does is to come up with a set of meaning postulates. I regard this as a kind of minimalist reading of surveyability for purposes of the philosophy of math. And so I'm just going to lay that out here. Number one, the surveyability of a proof consists in its possibility of exact reproduction. You can't just say that's one of the problems with LLM models and these things going on with AI now. They can't be reproduced in the same sense. The reproduction must be an easy task for a human. We must be able to decide with certainty whether the reproduction produces the same proof. And the reproduction of a proof is of the sort of the reproduction of a picture. And surveyable does not imply mathematical understanding. Perhaps this is the most controversial idea, but I think uh, Felix is right to divorce understanding as a necessary feature of that notion. So the main Hilbertian points for our purposes 
Number one, symbolic processes are a precondition of the application of logic and mathematics. So our thought in mathematics, once we get beyond subitizing, constantly involves symbolic parameters. These symbols are extra logical, says Hilbert, discrete and intuitively immediate, quote, before all thought, uh, anticipating one of Mauro's questions, I think he means before all mathematical thought. These symbols are irreducible and logic and mathematic certainty depends upon the surveyability of these symbols and all their parts. There's a certain kind of simplicity available and surveyability involves communicability and the termination of disputes. Finally, I do not think Hilbert is a formalist about the content of mathematics. I've been convinced by the really good scholarship on Hilbert, particularly Wilfred Zieg, that this is just a bad rap. Hilbert is interested in touching down on formal systems in order to enlarge the power of his understanding of the axiomatic method in mathematics. But he's not, even though he sometimes misspeaks, he's not really a metaphysician in the sense of a formalist. Here's Felix. Wittgenstein knew and discussed some of Hilbert's foundationalist writings of the 1920s, and I'm sure that despite his harsh criticism of Hilbert's metamathematics, he was strongly influenced by it. It appears very plausible that some of his remarks on the surveyability of proof not only express the subject of his subsequent investigations as self-citations, but that they also hint at the corresponding view of Hilbert, which Wittgenstein adopts in important respects and then expounds and uses in his own way. For me, this is very well said. So I think there's a kind of turning of Wittgenstein. So we have Hilbert in 1922 writing that in the beginning was the sign and Wittgenstein coming back at that with in the beginning was the deed with the sign. But there is a kind of interlocking commonality of purpose and we need to recognize that rather than only seeing Turing and Wittgenstein as enemies. Turing's machines. So in his computable numbers, what Turing does that's so different is he takes everyday marks of the concept of calculation for granted. And here I see the influence of the blue book on him. A human computer works locally step by step and can only take in a certain number of symbols at a glance. Again, we had Hilbert on that, but it's featured in the blue book as well. The computer says Turing takes in simple operations so elementary that it's not easy to imagine them, imagine them further divided. So there's the mark of ease. He's not saying that you couldn't further divide, but it's not so easy given what people are doing. Finally, and here I think this must be a direct allusion to the blue book. We avoid, here's Turing, we avoid introducing the notion of state of mind by considering a more physical and definite counterpart. It's always possible for the computer to break off from his work go away and forget all about it, and later come back and go on with it. If he does this, he must leave a note of instructions written in standard form, explaining how the work is to be continued. This note is the counterpart of the state of mind. So that whole idea of extruding, it's a Fergian idea as well, extruding mental entities by looking in the public space at what's being done, that's right at the heart of Turing's paper. Turing offers, I think, a language game, not a thesis about computability. He says he's going to argue, quote, by intuition, also by showing that the set of lambda calculable functions is coextensive with the Turing computable ones, and finally by giving examples of computable real numbers. So I think it should be called Church's thesis, not the Turing Church thesis. It's nice to credit him, but I don't think he had a view of analysis like Church did. The argument form was instead something like this. Suppose that what a human computation is in general, something like this, we give certain examples from the human sphere, then how could the procedures I imagine being followed not yield surveyability? I think that's the form of the argument. The Hilbertian features of the analysis are these. He crafts his particular diagonal argument very carefully. Or even an intuitionistic logician who rejects the law of excluded middle and infinite context can accept his proof as well as his analysis of the idea of a step in a formal system. And this is something Wittgenstein picks up on in 1947. Most computer scientists would tell you 
that what Turing did was to give a version of the halting problem, which is a diagonal argument where you build a contrary machine that goes down the diagonal and changes halt to not halt as it goes. Then you get a contradiction. But that argument builds negation into the machine. And it's very interesting that Turing brings that up as a possible argument and then puts it aside and says, I'm going to do something more uh, accessible, more easy to see. And then he gives what I call the positive diagonal argument, where you get the contradiction. It's not really a contradiction. You reduce the problem to a machine that cannot follow its own commands. So it's a rule following argument. It doesn't involve negation. And for that reason, you don't have to be an intuitionist to, you don't have to not be an intuitionist to accept his argument. In other words, his argument shows that it's not part of our notion of following a rule step by step, that we do or do not obey the law of the excluded middle. He makes it more of a language game issue. Furthermore, the human interface, the human context of a shareable command is demonstrated to be fundamental to the nature of computation by his argument, because he reduces everything to a machine that reaches a command that says, do what you do, sort of like turning up a card in a game that says, do what you do. The problem with that is not that it's contradictory. The problem is that you can't do anything with it. You can't follow it. So Turing's analysis of a step in a formal system um, is and must be altogether independent as well of which formal system we're speaking of or which states of mind are actually used. Now, Gödel was very taken with Turing's analysis. In all other cases treated previously, such as demonstrability or definability, he wrote, one has been able only to define them relative to a given language. And for each individual language, it's clear that the one thus obtained is not the one looked for. For the concept of computability, however, although it's merely a special kind of demonstrability or definability, the situation is different. By a kind of miracle, says Gödel, it's not necessary to distinguish orders, and the diagonal procedure does not lead outside the defined notion. In other words, you can't diagonalize out of the class of computable functions. It remains robust no matter what language you're in. And for Gödel, this was important because it settles a problem about the scope of his incompleteness result. Because you might have thought, in light of his 1931 paper, what if he hasn't dealt with all the possible formal systems that we could build? How can he have shown that arithmetic is incomplete by appealing to his system P? It could easily have been imagined, I suppose, or objected. There could be another formal system. So what Turing does is to settle the scope of application of his system of his incompleteness argument and makes it universal in that sense. So it's very important for Gödel. Again, the precise and unquestionably adequate definition, I'm not sure there are any unquestionably adequate definitions, but for Gödel it was so, of the general concept of formal system made possible by Turing's work allows the incompleteness theorems to be proved rigorously for every consistent formal system containing a certain amount of finitary number theory. And with Turing's analysis of computability, one has, for the first time, succeeded in giving an absolute definition that is not language relative of an interesting epistemological notion, i.e. one not depending on the formalism chosen. And what Gödel went on to try to do, as Juliet Kennedy in her recent book has explored, is to try to do for provability and definability something absolute, something transcending the limitations of any particular formal system in his further work in set theory. Here's the joke with Turing from the first lecture of 1939. What is a representative piece of application? Suppose I say to Turing, this is the Greek letter sigma, pointing to the sign. Then when I say, show me a Greek sigma in this book, he cuts out the sign I showed him and puts it in the book. Actually, these things don't happen. And again, don't treat your common sense like an umbrella. When you come into a room to philosophize, don't leave it outside, but bring it in with you. Now, a very interesting thing is that Wittgenstein never used the notion of a technique until 1937. It's a very commonly used notion among mathematicians, but certainly in Turing. And in the lectures, they discuss the notion of a technique 114 times. So my next paper will be to try to figure out what the importance is of the difference between the notion of practice and the notion of technique. Because I think technique does a lot of work for later Wittgenstein, generally. Okay, I want to say a few things about Turing, 
later on after 1939, again, in his 1942 to four paper, which remained unpublished, but that he wrote when he was at Bletchley, uh, the reform of mathematical to notation, he begins by saying, the statement of the type principle given below was suggested by lectures of Wittgenstein, but its shortcoming shouldn't be laid at his door. So that's just to say that what I'm saying about their mutual impact is not completely um, made up out of whole cloth. Here's Turing. Symbolic logic is a very alarming mouthful for most mathematicians. The logicians are not very much interested in making it more palatable. It seems, however, that symbolic logic has a number of small lessons for the mathematician, which may be taught without it being necessary for him to learn very much of symbolic logic. In particular, it seems that symbolic logic will help the mathematicians to improve their notation and phraseology. This is so interesting because I teach symbolic logic every year and ChatGPT can solve all the formalization questions in first order logic very quickly. So we have a question about how to teach logic. So Turing in 1942, we should conduct an extensive examination of current mathematical, physical and engineering books and papers with a view toward listing all commonly used forms of notation and examine them to see what they really mean. This will usually involve statements of various implicit understandings as between writer and reader, but the laying down of a code of minimum requirements for possible notations should be exceedingly mild, avoiding the straitjacket of a logical notation. It would not be advisable to let the reform of notation take the form of a cast iron logical system into which all the mathematics of the future can be expressed. No democratic mathematical community would stand for such an idea nor would it be desirable. I think at this time, Gandhi says he was reading Quine's mathematical logic. And so you can see how he is reacting against the kind of Carnapian treatment of ontology in Quine, where you imagine a cast iron logical system into which all ontology and mathematics of the future could be couched. Now I'll just close because we're supposed to be talking about the origins of 21st century philosophy. Arthur, I have a few minutes, I guess, right, to do one more section. Um, yes, yes, Professor, you have. Great. Okay, so I'll just say a few things about my opinionated reading of the Turing test. So one thing about Turing I think is really very nice is he's very speculative about AI. He did not think, by the way, that we should be building machines that look like human beings and our robots. He actually thought that that was going to be very expensive. And he ran a calculation that the size of this, from an engineering standpoint, would have to be the size of the Albert Hall if you tried to do it. So what he thought was actually software was more important. And he used to criticize the Americans. He used to say the Americans throw hardware at a problem. We throw software at a problem. So he was rather visionary in seeing the importance of software and language to the development of computation. And in fact, he wrote the first computer programming manual for the Manchester baby. And that was used to produce the very first computer generated music, which was God Save the Queen on the BBC, of course. Um, in any case, software language, much more important. But as he foresaw the future of intelligent machinery becoming far more complicated, he did speculate in 1948, and this is the founding document of AI, Intelligent Machinery. It's a report he wrote to the National Physical Laboratory before he went to Manchester. He thinks of intelligence, actually, in terms of a, an appreciation of the different kinds of search. I'll just repeat that, an appreciation of the different kinds of search. Now, given his work on the decision problem, you can see why he would have thought that. Also, if you were reading Philosophical Investigations or you knew Wittgenstein, that's not a bad thing to get out of Wittgenstein as a vision of what intelligence would be. So he starts speculating in this paper after he's described the future of the machinery. And he begins, he ends here with three kinds of search. And I just want to read these to you. The first is the intellectual search, as he calls it. We might arrange to take all possible arrangements of choices in order go on till the machine proved a theorem, which by its form could be verified to give a solution of the problem. Further research into intelligence of machinery will probably be very greatly concerned with searches of this kind. We may call them intellectual searches. So this is the search for algorithms. 
obviously. But there are two other searches. The second is the evolutionary search. So in my view, he is anticipating computational biology. He knew about Watson and Crick. You don't have to be a genius to see if you had computers to run through all the possible structural possibilities. That would help. It may be of interest, says Turing, to mention two other kinds of search in this connection. There is the genetical or evolutionary search by which a combination of genes is looked for, the criterion being survival value. The remarkable success of this search confirms to some extent the idea that intellectual activity consists mainly of various kinds of search. So this is what sounds to me a little bit like Charles Sanders' purse. You have a sort of evolutionary picture of the evolution of human language. But the final search that I just want to end with, he calls the cultural search. Notice there are no machines, it's humans. The remaining form of search is what I should like to call the cultural search. The isolated man does not develop any intellectual power. It's necessary for him to be immersed in an environment of other men whose techniques he absorbs during the first 20 years of his life. He may then perhaps do a little research of his own and make a very few discoveries which are passed on to other men. From this point of view, the search for new techniques must be regarded as carried out by the human community as a whole rather than by individuals. So this, I think, is very prescient, and I think we're very much at this point in time. So I hope that this wending through surveyability gets us a little closer. Now, I'm going to just say a couple of things about the Turing test before I end. In 1950, after he wrote this, Turing published his article in the philosophical journal Mind. He used to read out portions of it to his student Robin Gandhi and laugh. So it's not clear whether how serious this thing is. Norman Malcolm wrote to Wittgenstein to ask whether the article was a joke, and Wittgenstein replied that he hadn't read the article, but knowing Turing, he suspects it's no leg pull. So there is this whole question of how serious this whole thing is. This was a period of AI panic. I mean, it's a little bit foreshadowing what we're going through now. Lord Mountbatten had talked about an electronic brain being developed. The public was hysterical because of the dropping of nuclear weapons on Japan. So Turing went out on the BBC and started doing work in popular radio in order to try to get people thinking more cleanly about this. So I think this is the context of this particular article. Well, you all know the setup of the Turing test. There's a person behind the screen. And in the control he sets up, he very playfully takes gender difference as the control. So here we have the person behind the screen trying to determine who's a male and who's a female. And of course, given Turing's own life, you can see how playful he was about that, cross-dressing and so on and so forth. Who could act like a woman? But what I want to say about this is it's pretty obvious given how much our students want to talk about gender being constructed nowadays. This makes it very clear that this is a language game. It's taking place against the backdrop of a set of social distinctions that are historically contingent. Okay, so that's the importance to me of this. Then, of course, he runs the, the test with one person behind the screen, and it's now not male versus female, it's computer versus human. But what I would like to say about this is, actually, we have to remember that it's a language game. And after the test is run, C comes out from behind the screen and asks B, for example, would you like to have a cup of coffee with me? And depending upon what C has done, B may say yes or may say no. So the entire point of this is not to analyze and prove that machines can think. It's to say that people who say they can't think don't have a general analysis of the notion of thought. And so they can't prove anything about what can't be done. But more than that, it's a kind of Wittgensteinian phraseology experiment. So the point of the Turing test, as far as I can see, is to sort of investigate together with ourselves, you know, which human concepts are we willing to extend here and which ones not but the ultimate rubber is going to hit the road when C has to talk to B. It's, so it's not so much about human-machine interface. It's about human-human interface in the presence of machines. That at least is how I'm looking at it. And with mobile technology, which is, of course, the big change, which I'm not sure Turing did anticipate. Mobile technology around 2000, when that comes in across the globe, 
that's what really gets things going because you have a huge amount of data now. Um, so in a way, we're running the Turing test all the time, but I think that the important thing to remember from a Turing point of view is the human to human interaction here, the attempt to make surveyable the uses of our concepts in various ways. So what he's not doing with the Turing test is trying to prove that machines can think. He's not assuming that behaviorism is true. He's not trying to prove that machines are conscious and capable of emotion. He's neither trying to explain or deny the fact of consciousness. He's not trying to prove that humans are machines. He's tr not trying to prove that machines are indistinguishable from humans. And I don't think he's merely stipulating an operational or behavioristic definition of intelligence. And nor is he assuming that disinterpreted operations with signs are capable of grounding meaning. So that takes care of 90% of the literature on the Turing test, which I don't think is relevant to what he was actually doing. What I think he is doing is showing that one cannot prove a negative result, that machines cannot think, because as yet one does not have a clear enough concept of thought. He's showing us how we might explore together the, what he calls explicitly the emotional effects of computational machinery on our ways of expressing ourselves. He explicitly says that thinking is an emotional concept. Now, sometimes people think, well, Turing's trying to be rational and get rid of emotion. Not at all. I don't think that's what he's doing. He calls it, it's response dependent. That's the point. What he is doing is framing a repeatable social philosophically minded human to human experiment in phraseology or ordinary language in life. And so he's allowing us to make surveyable the alterations in our concept of thinking from case to case. I think I'll just stop there, Arthur, and uh, thank you very much. I hope I didn't go over time. I guess I need okay, to- thank you. Thank you, Professor Floyd. I guess, how do I stop sharing the screen, Arthur? Well, I can uh, remove it from the studio just temporarily, if that's the case. There we go. Is it oh, better? Oh, there you go. Oh. I think you had a connection problem with Professor Floyd. But I cut myself off rather than going off my slides. Um, uh, Pro Professor Mauro is just uh, went away for a bit. He's coming right back. But you, you didn't go um, over uh, time at all, Professor. We have uh, plenty of time. Great. Okay. Thank uh, you. So, if you, do, do do you want to? Um, you don't want to um, present your slides anymore. You can. No, I'm all set. That's the end of the slides. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Professor Mario, Mauro, he's becoming right back. Perfect.
so, uh, Professor Floyd, Professor Ubu, Professor um, Van der Schau will now open for uh, Professor Engel will be, uh, come back shortly. So for now, we just open for questions from our online keynote speakers, Professor Ubu, Professor Van der Schau, if you have, oh. <laughs> no. Well, um, thank okay, you. Okay, please. Oh, no, I'll, 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 I'll leave Professor Engelmann first. Okay, then. <laughs> you can go on. I thought it would be a short pause because I asked the guy here if I could go to the restroom. Okay, so thank you very much, Juliet, for your talk in your paper. I enjoyed very much, of course, reading it. And my comments would be really about the paper more than about the talk. Uh, there are some parts of the talk that are not indeed in the, in the paper. So several of my questions are uh, questions that I could ask Wittgenstein, but unfortunately this is not possible, so I'll ask Juliet instead. <clears throat> now, some of my questions are also very naive because I'm really puzzled about Wittgenstein's remarks on the foundation of mathematics particularly what comes after part one, actually. Okay, so survivability uh, as Überblickbarkeit, Überseebarkeit, and Übersichtlichkeit, as Juliet uh, points out, requires, I think, clarification for Übersichtlichkeit seems to be used by Wittgenstein quite differently from Überblickbarkeit and Übersehbarkeit. So, Übersichtlichkeit seems to refer quite generally to a characteristic that rules of grammar, as he says, in general, should have. So, those rules, however, might be rough representations, not exact ones. In this, they are not like proofs in mathematics. So, concerning the representation of colors, for instance, Wittgenstein remarks that the octahedron, the color octahedron, provides a rough representation of colors and that it simultaneously gives Ibasichlichkeit. So it seems that Ibasichlichkeit cannot be applied to calculations and proofs immediately. Perhaps the other notions of surveyability can. So it can be argued, however, that the notion changes after philosophical remarks, which I think is indeed correct. Now, however, the question now is how it changes and how this change connects with the philosophy of mathematics. So one aspect of Ibasichlichkeit in philosophical remarks and later in investigations is that it contrasts with explanation. So this can be seen in paragraphs 125 and 126 of the philosophical investigations. Now, and this appears also in the philosophical remarks where Wittgenstein says that the phenomenological grammar at the time uh, does not want to explain anything, it's just to describe. So this seems to be then a common feature of the, say, notion of kind in, say, 1930 and in investigation. So now it seems that proofs work in some ways as explanations. So it seems, again, then, that the Basichlichkeit is not the best notion to be used in mathematics unless it is very uh, particular, that it is used in a different way. Okay. So I'm not sure how one can apply the notion to proofs. So the question then is, which of the German words has the meaning given for survivability of a proof if it means that a proof can be reproduced easily, as Juliet, uh, following Mülzhäuser, argues. So reproducibility does not seem to be equivalent or even implied by the, the notion of Ibasichlichkeit we have talked about. Okay, now, the talk about reproducibility is also strange, for me at least, if we consider that we do not accept proof, a proof because it has been reproduced twice or a hundred times. Thus, it looks that for the proof itself, reproducibility cannot be an issue. Moreover, 
we might not have criteria to decide what counts as a correct reproduction. This is what Wittgenstein suggests, at least in part three, paragraph 44 of the remarks on the foundations. So Wittgenstein indeed, on the other hand, talks about the repro reproducibility of proofs as connected with survivability in the first paragraph of part three. However, now what is the meaning of proof there? It seems that the notion of proof in this context is restricted to calculations, like proofs of addition, simple proof, ordinary proofs in arithmetics. So Wittgenstein's point there is that if one tries to use Principia Mathematica to prove simple or complex additions, one will have a problem with the reproduction of proofs, so that one might really doubt the proof due to its lack of surveyability. A proof that translates equations into Principia Mathematica might look like an experiment. Now, what Wittgenstein wants to show in Principia, uh, in, in remarks on the foundations concerning Principia, is that there are no logical reasons for us to think that Principia Mathematica can be used to prove mathematical equations. Now, the interesting thing, I think, in those remarks concerning Principia is that Wittgenstein makes the following point. I just read that. <clears throat> so, that the acceptance of such a correspondence between some proofs and what we can reproduce in Principia Mathematica, he says, does not lean on logic. Now, my naive question here is how is this connected with uh, Juliet's work on um, Gödel and, and Wittgenstein, which is a fascinating work. Now, why this? Now, well, you can see that, you can say that uh, Gödel says something like this. If you, uh, the system of Principia Mathematica cannot prove all correct mathematical sentences. So this system has, one can, now one can read it, as this system then has a problem. So one could say then that, as a response, that logic is not uh, sufficiently uh, uh, expressed in Principia Mathematica. That is, logic is far more than what Principia Mathematica expresses as logic. Now, this is interesting because Wittgenstein, when he comes back to philosophy, he will say that the tractatus, the logic in the tractatus, that is just a little part of what logic is. So now, the naive question is, if this remark, Wittgenstein's remark on Principia in part three of the foundations is not a kind of conversation with Gödel in which Wittgenstein is saying, look, logic is far more complex than what Principia Mathematica thinks it is, okay. Now, <clears throat> Some comments concerning Hilbert. The, the idea of using Hilbert as a link between Wittgenstein and Turing, Turing um, uh, doesn't seem to me, at least for now, completely clear. Now, in the case of Hilbert, for instance, communicability of a proof is something relevant really for him? I don't know. Now, technique, concerning technique on page three of the paper, now, one wonders if the notion could be further specified. Now, Julia just said that this is part of the, her next project to specify. It. Now, what I wonder is um, what we have as uh, marks of technique is the following. Correct predictions of people calculating this points to what a technique is. Uh, the notion of agreement is fundamental because it's contrasts with confusion. And why is this relevant? Because if there is confusion, calculating loses its point. Now, what I think is interesting is that in the end, the notion of technique is completely dependent on a notion of point, right? And I wonder if this could be further specified. Okay, another point is uh, visualability and survivability, so to speak. So, some people have argued that surveyability is a visual criterion. Now, Juliet disagrees, as Mu shows him. Now, if it is not a visual, what is visual in it? 
considering that the three German words translated as survivability have all visual connotations. So why did Wittgenstein use words that refer to what is visual? <clears throat> now, one thing that worries me in the paper is that <clears throat> Juliet seems to equate <laughs> use in everyday life and forms of life in some passages. For instance, on page seven of the paper where she says, use in everyday life, Lebens formen. Okay, now the idea is then used on another part of the paper on page 12 to approximate Turing and Wittgenstein. Now, the question is where in Wittgenstein's work can this equivalent be found? Now, even if one finds it here or there, there is a quite different use, it seems, of the notion of form of life. For instance, in remarks on the Foundation of Mathematics, part one, where Wittgenstein uh, gives the example of a very strange tribe, which has a very particular way of dealing with the amount of wood, etc. And it's interesting that two paragraphs after he talks about survey survivability, where the notion is related to some kind of process. Um, so I'm not sure how now forms of life, survivability, survivability and everyday life come together, really. Now, the thing about Hilbert, I think, has been already <laughs> answered. Um, I will just uh, rephrase it a little bit so to see if Juliet has more comments on, on that. So Juliet quotes Hilbert, and when he talks about uh, numbers existing intuitively as immediate experience before all thought. So now it is not completely clear how this could be related to Wittgenstein's later notion of surveyability. It seems that the later Wittgenstein did not consider the relation between immediate experience and mathematics at all. Uh, so one might think then that before all thought would ex never express really a view by Wittgenstein. Uh, if it is before all mathematics, uh, I'm not sure if it if it uh, if it really is different from before all thought for them. Anyway, <clears throat> um, concerning uh, some aspects of Wittgenstein in Hilbert and the Tractatus. Now, Juliet says the following in the paper. In 1929-31, Wittgenstein was repudiating his earlier conception of the unity of logic as a single absolute system. By responding to Hilbert's metamathematics, meta he was incorporating the formalist point of view, attempting to give it its due in a kind of game formalism. Now, in some ways, I think this may be true, in some ways not. So one might think that this had already happened in the Tractatus, because their number is indeed a formal concept. Perhaps the Tractatus is not really completely formalist, because contrary to formalist, the Tractatus, from a, logist, uh, uh, from a point of view of logicism, is trying to explain the application of mathematics. So how? Does the Tractatus explain the application? Well, he says the use of mathematics takes place with sentences in language. What we have to explain then is the notion of substitution in equations. This will explain the use. And so if we generate these equations with the general form proposition, we have explained how one can apply mathematics uh, to the role. Now, what happens when Wittgenstein comes back to philosophy in 1929-30 is that he says, that the application takes care of itself. So one can read then that Wittgenstein was already a kind of formalist of sorts in the Tractatus because he had a formal conception of number. And then in his return, he incorporated another element of formalism, which in his view was that we do not explain the application of mathematics because the application must take care of itself. That is, it is contingent. If we apply, we apply. If we don't, we don't. <clears throat> now, um, another interesting 
point in Julia's paper was that, <clears throat> as I, she claims in page 12, 13, church thesis, as it came to be called, sometimes even called the church Turing thesis, was, however, not quite Turing's thesis. Now, I wonder if this point could be further developed. Right? Uh, why can it be misleading to talk about the church Turing thesis? So what does Turing think about church, or church lambda calculus, and so on? It might be one of the cases in which uh, Turing sees himself in one way, and everybody who follows him sees him in, in a very different light. This could be quite interesting historically, of course. Now, <clears throat> on page 13, <clears throat> uh, there is a quote of Turing. So there, Turing talks about that one must leave a note of instructions written in some standard form explaining how the work is to be continued. So this note is the counterpart of the state of mind. What I think is, I think, of course, Juliet knows it, but it, it, this looks very Wittgensteinian for he suggests a number of times that when one is confused, about the hidden workings of the mind, one should think of the use of physical samples instead, color samples, for instance. So now this illustrates, it seems, um, what is said in the paper, uh, of Juliet, but there is no link that is explicitly made in the paper. So I wonder if there is a reason for this, because this seems to me that it uh, could be a strong um, point to make the connection between Wittgenstein and Turing in the sense that Turing was, of course, influenced by, by Wittgenstein. <clears throat> now, on page 15 of the paper, it, Juliet says, what Turing shows and Wittgenstein later emphasizes is that our concept of computation depends upon features of the surrounding world, the necessities of mathematics, right on the back of numerous contingencies of our form of lives. And these may and will evolve as we embed routines and words in the stream of life in a variety of ways. Now, what concerns me in this passage is that it seems to suggest that Wittgenstein learned from Turing that there is a dependence of concepts upon contingent features of the external world. However, Already in 1930, Wittgenstein considered, for instance, that rulers and other instruments are just part of language because they are determinants of sense. So you have some contingent elements determining sense for Wittgenstein very early on, so before he actually met Turing. Now, the passage also suggests that forms of life is more or less synonymous with numerous contingencies. However, the concept appears when Wittgenstein wants to show strange variations of present contingencies and things that we ordinarily do. Now, the thing is, uh, the concept of form of life is very strange in, for Wittgenstein, and it doesn't seem to be just not something ordinary, as earlier Juliet said, and what now she says con that, that it expresses numerous contingencies. So, um, now, again, I'm not sure how we deal with forms of life, after all. Now, um, concerning what Juliet says about the pluralism of techniques. Now, does this plurality include or exclude the strange tribes that are presented in forms of life? The strange tribes then that operate in disagreement with our techniques. So how can we include or exclude techniques in forms of life. Oh, I think this is all I had to, to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arthur, for having Mauro be my commentator. It's um, always such a pleasure. He's such a careful reader and such a master of all of Wittgenstein especially these transitions between middle and later. So I don't know how long I have to respond. I'm sure I could go on for at least an hour. But uh, I'll, I'll try to make this quick, Arthur. I guess we have a certain amount of time. I, 
I'll start toward the end. Mauro, you're quite right that I should have cited the blue book when I quoted in the paper that extrusion of the notion of state of mind. The problem is that I started writing about Turing and Wittgenstein a long time ago, so I have a string of papers. I've actually gotten much farther with Turing than I ever thought I would. I started working on it in about 2010. I always suspected there were connections, but I really have been surprised at, at how philosophically sophisticated Turing was. So I have a string of papers, and I already made that point in a couple of the papers, so that's why I didn't put it in again. <laughs> but you're quite right that I should have put in. So if there's a way to change it, then I'll put that reference to the blue book in, because I think I agree with you. It's one of the strongest textual points where you might say, assuming Turing heard about the blue book or read the blue book, which we have no proof yeah. of, but which seems highly, highly like it's a, um, it's a good link with the tradition. So let me go through here. Now, the quote you make about the Übersichtlichkeit and the rules of grammar, I have not investigated whether Übersehbarkeit, Überblickbarkeit, and Übersichtlichkeit, I have not investigated the different uses of those terms in Wittgenstein. So the first point is to thank you for telling me that I now have a task that I have to do. It's very interesting that Übersichtlichkeit you associate with a presentation of rules of grammar, say the color octahedron, and could have roughness. I think what's key for me is that you, you yourself contrasted this idea of Übersichtlichkeit with explanation. It's not an explanation of the grammar of the color words. Okay, now the analogy in Wittgenstein would be that metamathematics is not a theory of proof. It's not an explanation for why a proof works. So in fact, I think I'm grateful to you for pointing it out. There is a very strong connection between lacking an explanation or thinking of something as a theory versus looking at something as providing us with a kind of snapshot that helps us go on. Now, one question is why is the visual language embedded in the verb? And I think it's to do with what you emphasized when you said that it's very beautiful what you said, a technique always has a point. <laughs> so, this is the notion of C, and we have Thomas here. Your German is also very good, Mauro, where I would say, I see your point. I see what you mean. So the visual is already embedded in this way of talking, and I take it that this is why it's embedded here. And what Felix and I and others would uh, dispute is the idea that it is something that has psychological overtones. Although, of course, one has to admit that there's a quick limit you meet in what human beings can process perceptually. I agree that the question is, how does this change in Wittgenstein after philosophical remarks? And it would be nice to be clearer about how my story works there. I don't think that the point about reproducibility, though, um, and there's a lot you said here, which I'm going to miss on the fly. To me, the reproducibility is very important. I mean, it goes back to Frege. Uh, he's worried in the case of Principia, as you say, that if we have a long proof, there might be a problem about disagreeing whether we have the same proof over again or not. Um, then the point is that what do we do? We stitch together Principia with alternative mathematical techniques. And I think it's less important that they're arithmetical equations that they, that then, then that they involve other mathematical techniques. So the point would be that Principia doesn't serve as a Grundlagen der Mathematik. It doesn't show that math is grounded in some way or explained by logic, but rather we have a set of variety of techniques that work together and Principia might help us lay out the Grundlegung of the foundations of mathematics, but it's only a moment in working through what really belongs to mathematics as a distinctive practice. And as you know very well, in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein does not reduce mathematics to tautologies. He was not a logicist in that sense, even though, of course, his account of number as evinced in everyday applications is highly indebted to Frege. Uh, 
So one thing I would say, because Maria's here too as a Frege scholar, there's a really complicated interaction with Frege going on here that needs, I think, more explanation. When he's talking to the Vienna Circle in the 30s, Wittgenstein criticizes Frege's arguments against formalism. So he says Frege is too quick. He makes it sound like, you know, if you're a formalist, you have to think that, you know, the forms are just marks on a chalkboard. Obviously, that's not what formalism is all about. So I take it that that is, could be read, I'm reading it, as speaking to the Hilbert metamathematics of the time and suggesting that the response to formalism in that form has to be much more sophisticated than with the materials that Frege gave us. So I think that the interaction with Hilbert is indeed very important and it can't really be seen that Wittgenstein is a formalist or is not a formalist, but he thinks that the discussion of formalism in metamathematics of Hilbert is extremely important. And my accounting for why he was so interested in Turing, of course, Wittgenstein was the one who first framed the decision problem for logic in a letter to Russell of 1913. It's impossible to me he would not have been interested in what Turing was do doing because in a sense, it was his problem. Now, there's the stuff about Gödel that you said. I have to think more about this. The idea that logic is not fully expressed in Principia is a way of thinking about that, that somehow logic and mathematics bifurcate. But again, um, I think the same would be true for Hilbert, actually. And in a way, the same was true for Wittgenstein, even from the Tractatus. So, um, yes, Wittgenstein was a kind of formalist, if you like, in the Tractatus, because he doesn't think the equations are propositions. They're really rules of substitution. But what's very striking is that he takes the human activity of calculation with a symbolic routine as a fundamental of our grasp of logic and language and mathematics. And what's absolutely fascinating to me is that in a way, this is what Turing shows is the move you need to make with respect to the foundations of logic. You have to take very seriously this idea of a repetitive recursive rule and make sense of that. So that's why I think it had such an impact on Wittgenstein because he had already orbited in the area of this kind of view. So I agree with you that the Tractatus is great. Now, Hilbert as a link is unclear because reading Hilbert is very hard. And there are a lot of competing Hilberts out there. The phenomenologists will tell us one thing. People have their views about Hilberts. But I'm just taking for granted what I take to be the best scholarship on Hilbert. And Hilbert says things he shouldn't have said, and Wittgenstein picks him up on that. But the main impact of Hilbert is for Wittgenstein to insist that metamathematics is just more mathematics. It's not a meta level. And I think that's a very profound move and has a lot of implications for Wittgenstein's own views, both about the nature of logic, the role of logic, and also the role of mathematics. So I'm very charitable to Hilbert here. I think Wittgenstein is more charitable to him than maybe the first generation or two of literature made it sound. I think that this idea of technique really is important and I am very much at the beginning of that. So I'm really grateful for your saying technique is completely dependent on this notion of a point. At the moment, I would put it this way, that I would contrast the notion of a practice in later Wittgenstein with the notion of a technique. So a practice seems to emphasize that what we're dealing with is activity. Language is acted out in forms of life. And a practice could be reconstructed according to a variety of different representations in terms of rules. That would sort of pick up on what you said about middle Wittgenstein and the color octahedron. It could be rough. Okay, so there's that idea going on, but um, that's not, you might say, the only idea going on a side point here about proof. Um, you worry that proof is exact and not rough. But I'm not so sure, even in proof theory, that that's true. 
I would think that the role of formalized proof, even for Hilbert, is more like the color octahedron representation of rules uh, because there could be different ways of reconstructing our color grammar, just like there could be different ways of reconstructing the force of a proof. So I think Hilbert actually invites the investigation of a more pluralistic way of looking at the variety of kinds of proofs than you might think. And Wittgenstein is really pressing on this point. Anyway, back to technique. So the notion of practice occurs fewer times in the investigations than technique. And as I say, technique in the 39 lectures is absolutely at the heart of it. Now, the thing about the notion of technique as mathematicians use it is the following. Something that works one off. Okay, let's suppose that in Gödel's paper, Gödelization, the coding of the syntax. Let's suppose that just happened once. Then mathematicians would call it a trick. And in fact, Gödel sometimes said that his proof was a parlor trick. But the point is, if it becomes more methodical, if it becomes like a machine part that you could pull out of one context and put into another context, it's like a piece of technology or a way of thinking has been invented, then the mathematicians will call it a technique. There are many examples of this, Scott's trick, for example, in set theory, where you figure out how to present the ordinals in a certain way. It was called a trick originally in the context of the first proof. But then you begin to see, ah, I would say diagonalization became a technique. And that's one reason Wittgenstein is fascinated with contour and fascinated in discussing this term with, with uh, Turing because techniques, rather, rather than practice, which emphasizes activity, techniques are sort of on the fly, cobbled together pieces of human routine and architecture, which we lean on when we're trying to solve this or that particular problem. And it's the variety of techniques, their role with respect to embedding language in evolving forms of life, that is the important thing. Um, there's also resonance with the notion of technology. The notion of technique is very complicated. But that's what I would say about practice versus technique. I think sometimes people lean too heavily, readers of Wittgenstein, on the idea of practice being an explanation. For example, we can follow rules because these are practices. But I think the situation is more complex for Wittgenstein, and it's deeply related to this question of how to read forms of life. So in closing, I'll just say a couple of things about that. I do confuse use in everyday life versus Lebensform, and that's very lazy of me. I should not have done that in the paper. But um, I, would, I, would, I would look at it this way. So forms of life have kind of two aspects, let's say, to start with in the investigations. One is this kind of roughly more universal mark of humans insofar as they have gotten where we are. Namely, we chat, we walk, we smile at babies. It's almost a biological, quasi-evolutionary thing. Then there's forms of life used much more locally. Forms of life are particular things. So let's say in the form of life of Judaism, you know, we bless the wine Friday night and light the candles. So there are kind of very specific things. And here we have rituals, we have techniques, we have ways of cobbling the embedding of words in forms of life that involve maybe more variety. It's maybe more of a wild jungle of different things. Okay. But really, in the end, that's what Hilbert was worried about, by the way, was modern mathematics becoming a jungle, like a wild English garden. And the point of proof theory was to try to organize a little bit. So with Laban's form and the strange tribes, you're absolutely right about that passage about the people, the wood sellers and so on. I do have to have a reading of that because surveyability comes in. I think what we come to appreciate about these strange tribes is you might say that they have a technique. It's pretty robust. I mean, the wood sellers, whatever the point of what they're doing is, and we might not see the point right away. What we could do is to see it's a reproducible technique. It's robust enough to hold up under transformations. 
and that human beings can learn it. Okay, so somehow technique has to do with that very much. And I'm grateful for your connecting it with forms of life because it's the second notion of forms of life where we have this dynamic evolving embedding of words in the shifting forms of life. That's where techniques that are put together come in importantly. Now, finally, a difference between Wittgenstein and Turing. Wittgenstein says in the investigation that there aren't techniques for certain things. <laughs> so one thing that there's not a technique for is determining the genuineness of the expression of human emotion. That's in part two. So these are the mention kenners. These are the people who are very good at spotting authenticity in the expression of human emotions. And Wittgenstein says, yes, there are things, there are people like this. And then he asks, can it be taught? And he says, yes, you could teach someone this, you know, with careful observation and technique. But then he says, are there rules or techniques for this? And the answer is no. Now, the question with Turing, but it's a question, is with the Turing test, is Turing, when he says intelligence is emotional, is Turing agreeing with Wittgenstein or not agreeing with Wittgenstein? My reading of the Turing test is a little bit unclear. Maybe Turing is even agreeing with Wittgenstein. There aren't techniques for determining the authenticity of whether something is a chatbot or a human. It's going to be difficult to develop techniques in the sense of rules for that. But then maybe the open-ended question in our world with poetry and chat GPT and all these things is, nevertheless, you know, will there be something distinctive that a mention Kenner can use to work with language in a more localized way in forms of life? So I hope that helps with technique. Uh, I'm sorry, there are many, many more things to say. And <laughs> this conversation will go on, Mauro. I'm very grateful because I think any work I do in the future is going to be much better because of these comments. So next time I'll send you my paper before I publish it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And maybe, Arthur, I should stop there. Maybe Mauro wants to respond. I don't know. I don't know how busy I've been. Do you have a few questions? Replies, Professor? Uh, I think I'm very satisfied, of course, with the, the answer. I just, um, my only concern now in the end is, is, I think we have talked about forms of life before, right? But now, just something quick. Now, you said there's a universal mark of form of life when you talk about humans, how humans talk, walk, etc and then more specific ones that are those yeah. tribes. Now, I would see it in the other way, I think, because I think this what these tribes show is that you have like a form, really, in the sense of variations. Now, when, yeah. when you, you want to reach the less possible ground for anything, then you reach the variations of forms of life. So in the sense, then, these variations in these many tribes, they are actually more universal than our form of life and our talk, our walking, and, and, and so on. So I'm not sure just if this... Uh, it, and I understand what the point you want to make, but I'm not sure if the point can be made with the distinction between more universal and less universal and specific and universal. That's the uh, yeah, I think this is very good. I mean, as usual in the investigations, it's very carefully orchestrated. So I would say when he first lists those things, I forget what section, around section 19, 23. Yeah, he lists them in a way that they could look like marks of the human. Mm -hmm. But then as the book proceeds, and as we look at his manuscripts and we see more, we see that this Goethean point about variation, going from one to the next, the locality of it is very, very important because it's that friction with locality. I mean, this is, I guess, his big move in the philosophy of logic, the notion of truth, all the things Frege wanted, he wants to say, you can only have if you have this local sensitivity to the point of what humans are doing. 
Okay, as a side point, that's very interesting relative to the notion of computability because am I arguing that the notion of computability is occasion sensitive? You know, maybe I'm ultimately arguing that, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, it's this orchestration where he begins with, oh yeah, forms of life roughly like this, humans, and then we begin to see the exquisite complexity, for example, of what it is to be chatting with someone. I mean, after you've read the rest of the investigations, <laughs> The whole concept of what chatting is might be radically changed. So I didn't intend to think, think that he somehow, I think this is good, he's not got this universal idea and then he's filling it in with particular examples. But rather the whole point is that attention to these more parochial features of life, this anthropological turn in his thinking, the radical thing is to see that that's the price, taking that seriously is the price of doing what Frege wanted to do for the notions of truth and thought. And there's a very, very beautiful manuscript, I'm sorry, I forgot the number right now, where I think he really sees this in around 1937. And he, he, the manuscript has to do with sort of different ways of putting things. Is there a way to get clear about perceptual remarks, about mathematical remarks? And then he tries out the idea that with every sentence is associated one technique. Okay, that's a little reminiscent of the middle Wittgenstein. And he tries that, and then he finally reaches this place in the manuscript where he says, no, no, every sentence has multiple techniques associated with it. And then he's very honest with himself. He says, and now all that was said before about Zinn, Bedeutung, and Wahrheit is useless to me. So he's sort of recognizing that now he's made a turn and he's going to have to reconstruct everything from that different point of view. But I, if I invited the idea that there's a general and then you fill it in with the particular, then that I think is wrong. It's our fields of variation. Yeah. Just to, uh, I also, would like to say that I, I enjoy very much your clarification of the notion of technique and its constructs with practice. I think that's very, very useful. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you showed me why it's more useful than just useful for thinking about the text of the 1939 lectures, because it's basically a textual problem that people haven't understood. But I think your connection with forms of life is very important. Well, um, thank you, Professor Mauro. Thank you, Professor Floyd. We'll now open to questions beginning with our online keynote speakers, Professor Thomas Zubo and Professor Maria van der Schaaf. Please. Um, well, uh, if, if Maria wants to go first, I don't know. Okay. All right. Uh, I uh, thank you very much for your... Can, uh, is, do, is my microphone on? Yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. Okay, so thank you very much, Juliet, for this uh, very interesting and wide, wide-ranging talk, which in, in 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 many parts sort of leads me squarely out of my comfort zone. So <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll go back to rather what uh, something you 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 said towards the end of your talk, namely you, where you where you spoke about the Turing test, and you said something uh, I found very striking, namely you. You told us what the Turing test was not doing, and then you suggested, if I got it right, that uh, one could see the Turing test as an attempt to make surveyable the concept of thought or thinking. Mm -hmm. And that, well, that was very striking. So, what would you because just that, that, that then, well, in a way, quite clear well i'm not unclear, but but it sort of su suggests to take that notion of surveyability somewhat away from uh, just concern with mathematics alone and and broadens it to uh, gives gives it wider application which then links with what you said earlier about that in fact for wittgenstein that notion of übersichtlichkeit then was obviously more you said not metamathical but rather of anthropological import now Putting, taking, putting, putting that 
sort of sort of on the on on the table. So there's the anthropological reading of surveyability. Another aspect of of that term seems to be if one pursues that. So it might be that surveyability may not be. Uh, primarily concerned with provability but more with intelligibility in a more in a more more general slightly more diffuse sense so putting those two things together um because i was wondering well what might it mean to make the concept of thoughts available and then putting the Turing test together. So now throwing in the anthropological interest and, uh, and, 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 and the notion of intelligibility, I'm wondering whether, well, that leads me basically to my question, is there any relationship at all, conceptual or whatever, be, be, between this idea of the Turing test of making the notion of thought intelligible and the Wittgensteinian motto, it's probably not a not a literal uh, version I present now, of saying no talk of the inner without outward criteria. Does, uh, or is this just a very loose association of mine? Thomas, thank you. No, I feel beautifully understood. And actually, it's incredibly helpful to articulate this kind of general lift. You're absolutely right. I'm trying to go deep down and dirty into the details of the logical tradition. And my first job is to insist, you know, this is what's going on initially in the background when Wittgenstein takes it on. You're absolutely right. I'm trying to lift to some more general standpoint that we could use now as people been, begin talking about automated, not only automated proofs, but all sorts of things in, in the world we live in today. So I'm very grateful for this. I think it does broaden beyond mathematics. I think Turing thought it did. I think Turing thought the evolution of how we speak to one another and what we can find intelligible in localized context would be a driving force in, in the, the design of computers and their power. And notice that with this mobile technology, that's why people want our data. <laughs> I mean. ChatGPT is not surprising because the ordinary language philosophers tell us, Austin, a lot of what we say is predictable and language wouldn't work unless that were so. <clears throat> so this Hilbertian idea of, you know, ending, terminating without dispute is part of our action with language. And I'm, I'm grateful to you. I do think I'm, I'm coming toward some notion of intelligibility in some much more diffuse sense. So rhetorically, when I say Übersichtlichkeit doesn't have to do with understanding, I maybe have to revise that a little bit. I was led to agree with Felix about that. But maybe intelligibility in some diffuse Wittgensteinian sense is what we're after. And you use the notion of a motley. It's very important. What Wittgenstein says is mathematics is a motley of techniques, not a motley of rules. So I think this whole idea is incredibly important, the anthropological, and yes, ultimately the inner and the outer, how that structuring of language is going to work in a human to human environment in the presence of machines. That's really what I'm interested in. So yes, I do intend this, but I haven't really developed it to be a, a more general kind of discussion. But I think then the notion of surveyability becomes quite attenuated from the Hilbert context and much more parochial and localized, which kind of puts your points together with Malraux in a way. Um, who is to say whether we've really surveyed a personality of a person or a speech act? You know, the notion of surveyability is highly contextual and to some extent variable. Nevertheless, it really lies in some way at the foundation of our linguistic behavior. For example, in the law, there was a case in New York recently of a brief that was put in, in a motion to a judge that had been written by ChatGPT and it hallucinated several cases. The, the, the opposing attorneys went to look up the list of cases and they don't exist. And the judge came down very hard on that lawyer who used ChatGPT, why? Because the, the law won't work unless we can terminate disagreements. <laughs> I 
if we're dealing with things that go on and on and on that humans, it, it's too hard for humans to reproduce, then you can't have things work. So somehow these things are all related, but I, I'm, I'm grateful for this. I think this more diffuse sense of intelligibility is very, very important. And I guess I think if Turing were here, he'd be getting us to think about, you know, how are you stretching your concept of agency, intention, the way people in the high tech business talk. There's a lot of stretching of language going on, and there's really a lot at stake in our figuring out philosophically whether we accept those analogies, in what sense we accept those analogies. Maybe we accept them for purposes of very localized situations. So I'm willing to say that my computer is searching for something, but you know, nevertheless being humanly aware of the many-sided character of that concept as it's actually embedded in forms of life. That's where philosophy comes in. It's incredibly important. And I think it's much more important for our thinking about AI than, for example, people who talk about uploading ourselves to become immortal. I mean, you know, it's okay in an intro class to do that. But, you know, the entire point of morality is that I only have one shot. If you change that, then everything else about intelligibility becomes wrong. So thank you for that. And the inner and the outer, I have to think more about that. How do we actually erect that distinction in practice is huge. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I ask a question? Maria, that would be great. First, first <laughs> um, it was about the formalism in Wittgenstein. So if you look at the Tractatus, if you look at the concept of sign there, uh, perhaps we should change it and say, well, the, the prior notion in the conceptual order is the notion of symbol. But so in the Tractatus, we, ha we have the notion of symbol. And then, of course, the Frege's criticism on the formalist wouldn't work. And if you then go to the later Wittgenstein, then the, let's say, the, the, the name that's internally related to the object, that is the symbol, that becomes something like, a term together with the the grammar, the rules of grammar. So you have here a sign that is not just a signature on paper. It's a sign, uh, yeah, that's more like a symbol. So if you have a formalism like that, then I think Frege's criticism wouldn't apply. Would that work? Is that your idea? Yeah, I think that nicely reconstructs both for early and later Wittgenstein why he would have said that to the Vienna Circle about Frege, that he thinks Frege attacks formalism, you know, on its weak side, <laughs> but he's not really thinking enough about symbolization. And I guess you're the expert on Frege. I, I think of this as, you know, Wittgenstein's very much different from Frege and Russell. And here I'm indebted to my colleague Sanford Shea. We talk constantly about such things. Um, for Wittgenstein, it's always the possibility of expressing something. So it's a modal notion. The notion of form has to do with the possibility of structure. So in the Tractatus, form is the possibility of structure is for me at the moment the most important remark. So this notion of a symbol is part of that. So it's the possibility of writing down a calculation, let's say in the Arabic notation, that shows you something, not something about the Arabic notation, you might say itself even though you could study how the Arabic notation is contrasting with the Roman notation or any one of a number of other notations. So it's attention to the expression of thought in language that let's say, but depending on how one reads Frege, maybe we could say Frege underrated or underestimated how important this distinction between sign and symbol would be. But surely it is this notion of symbol and not sign. It's the sign, the sign in use. And we presuppose, you know, as he writes in the notebooks, A is the same sign as A. So it's the symbol, it's not the sign. And criteria of re-identifiability are very important and therefore the use of the notion. Um, and it's just so fascinating with Turing because now, Turing's whole analysis depends upon there being these, so to speak, concrete signs that the human can take in at a glance. 
But as Wittgenstein's reminding him, I think, in 1939, you know, these are symbols, not signs. They're symbols in use. So that's very helpful to me about the 39 lecture at the opening when he makes that joke with Turing. <laughs> There's a lot of history behind that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we have um, no more questions from Professor uh, Thomas Huber or Professor Van der Schaaf, I would like to ask our audience here in the auditorium if um, anyone has any questions to Professor Floyd. So if we have no questions here in the auditorium, Professor, if Professor Engelman has or any other question or Professor Maria no. or Professor yeah, of course. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when, when, when we saw the Hilbert slides, then one of the criteria for surveyability was that it was easy to see somehow. Yeah. But that sounds very much like a psychological notion. And it's also in a certain sense, you have to develop in a certain sense to become a mathematician. You have to be someone to see it. So, so you have to, in order to make it non-psychological, you, you have to build in so much. Can you explain it a little bit more? Yeah, no, it's, it's right. And, you know, I, I should not perhaps glide so quickly over these alternative readings of Turing. <laughs> as basing things on psychology for that reason. But easy to see, I'm reading in a practical sense okay. that you don't have to go off and give a separate calculation, you know, or do some structural things in math in order to make sense of a certain transition. So it, it's very true that in an unformalized proof, there would be, so to speak, gaps from a, from a let's say, a Fregean point of view. Um, but nevertheless, the hallmark of the activity, even before Frege, is that you could, most people would make those transitions in Euclid unproblematically. Now, now then you can imagine, yeah, but okay, but then there are different geometries, there's all of this mess, math is becoming very abstract, it's like a wild English garden. So we, we now have to try to organize things. So Hilbert wants to use the axiomatic method to do that. And he's very committed to that as a mathematical practice in order to show the interrelations among the concepts. So I guess easy to see in my view has to do with what mathematicians do all the time. All the time you abbreviate. There's symbolic density. And yes, this has psychological connotations and the study of the psychology of number and math is very fascinating how people learn how to do this and so on. But easy to see means it terminates without disputes and it's recognizably mathematical. And that doesn't mean that you couldn't press down on any particular case and begin to analyze it. But obviously, when you have very, very long, let's <laughs> say, very, very long numerals, Wittgenstein talks about this, you know, and Frege, in a way, Frege talked about this too when he criticized Mill, you know, what do you do with the difference between one million and one million and one? But what we do do is to write it down in exponential notation, for example. So we make it more condensed. And in a sense, that's what mathematics is there for us to do. And I, I'm taking it that that example of the stroke notation where subitization gives out, that's sort of, if you like, uh, the beginnings of this story about what mathematics is. Mathematics is there to make it, render it, something you can take in. And then intelligibility, a la Thomas's question, you know, what do we mean by intelligibility there might be somewhat diffuse. So there's a psychological reality to this, of course, but then there's also this action. Do we agree? 
And again, in our modern world, yes, we're all using our cell phones and they're building a cognitive avatar of you that makes predictions. And a lot of what you do is predictable. So that's nice. That all works for them. And that's cognitive psychology. But is that the same as rendering actions intelligible to you or making surveyable what's going on when you use geolocation and take your car from one place to the other? Not so obvious. You might have to do a lot of work to sort of say what an action is. This is why Anscombe is so interesting. I mean, she really focuses on this notion of an action that's really fundamental and begins to spell out the logic of that. And again, I don't think what Anscombe was doing was psychology. If you like, it's the logic of our concept of an action. Yeah, and, that, and an action, it, that, it's more like an, there's an agent, and that also makes it different from psychology, because yeah. it, it, it's not that it's from an external point of view. It's something you do by yourself. So if you're an educated mathematician, you are able to see it, and then it's of course not no longer a psychological notion because you know, in a certain sense, what it means, or you know how to go on. I see. Thank you. Yes, but I will say it's a good point you raised, Maria, because in the mathematics community, there's a lot of debate now about automated proof. You know, yeah. I mean, some mathematicians say, "Look, well, if the goal is mathematical truth." Just, you know, automate all this stuff. And then, you know, maybe once a year out of the National Security Agency, the priest mathematician will come out and report to us on what the interesting theorems are that were printed out by the machines. You know, that could be yeah. one image of the future. But that's not the image of surveillability, ideally. I mean, even imagining the priest means that sort of we're making things intelligible by using the priest. But, you know, then others in the mathematics community want to see mathematics as conceptual constructions that we make. So that's an argument in the community about surveyability and what the hallmarks would be. Not psychology. Yeah. Quite clear now. Thank you. Yeah. So do we have um, any other questions? either from our online participants or from the audience. No? Okay. So I would like to thank um, Professor Judith Floyd for being here with us on the uh, 14th edition of this annual event. I'd like also to thank Professor Thomas Ubel and Professor Maria van der Schaaf for participating, as well as Professor Mario Engelman for his comments. I would like to thank our online and our audience here in the auditorium. And I would remind everyone that the 14th meeting of Studies on the Origins of Contemporary Philosophy will have an afternoon session today with talks by Professor Mauro Engelman and Professor Sheila Tomé. And that the event will occur throughout the week here at Auditorium 239. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.